appearing tonight. Speaker Nancy Pelosi, Dr. Anthony Fauci, Billy Porter, Alicia Garza, Chris Evans, Joe Kiani, and Mark Cassin. The Atlantic Festival is brought to you through the generous support of Facebook, Genentech, Hewlett Packard Enterprise, Walton Family Foundation, Allstate, Eli Lilly and Company, U.S. Bank, AARP, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Exxon Mobil, John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, Nestle Waters North America, and PayPal. Good evening. I'm Adrienne LaFrance, the Atlantic's executive editor. We've got a stellar lineup for tonight's Atlantic Festival Idea Stage. We'll hear from Dr. Anthony Fauci, Billy Porter, and more. But first, the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, with my colleague, our Editor-in-Chief, Jeffrey Goldberg. Madam Speaker, nice to see you. Hi, Jeffrey. How are you? Happy birthday. How? Happy birthday. That was a that was actually a state secret until just about now. Just that now? was a state secret. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, I understand. We have a um, saying. How are you? I'm okay. We I'm running a couple minutes behind because we're just bringing as we've been working on all day, but right now, bring it to the floor, our continuing resolution to keep government open that I'm very excited about, and I hope the Republicans will vote for it, but right. uh, I, we, have an agreement. I, we have an agreement with the administration. I, I wanted to ask you. Okay. Right. I wanted to ask you uh, about that. Um, I want to get to Justice Ginsburg uh, and the pandemic and everything, but but give us give us just a little bit more of a flavor of this uh, continuing resolution. There's a big compromise here for you in that you're you yeah. agreed to uh, a lot of money to the farmers. Is that correct? Well, there's there's a, a something that but I agreed to a clean CR. Uh, what the definition of a clean CR on the Republican side is what we want should be in there, what you want shouldn't, and that's what we call clean. But I was very pleased we were able to accomplish a number of things with the leverage they gave us by wanting to have uh, that CC, what we call CCC money. Um, some of our members support that. So, but it, but the fact is that we were able to get just almost eight billion dollars and food for, for the pandemic emergency, food for children in school and uh, child care centers. We were able to get money for lunch pro meals for children in school. Sometimes they're not even attending. We were able to, um, I was very pleased, and, and that is for children in the territories as well. But I was very pleased what we were able to do for seniors, which was to just between us and so the Republicans, I think, made a big mistake in what they were doing with the Medicare Part D, and we saved them from themselves uh, by having it just be a very, instead of $50 a month, more like 4 or $5 a month in terms of Medicare Part D. So again, anyway, there are different pieces of the bill uh, where we We, 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 we won't let them know. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, we won't. We won't tell anyone. Uh, this is just a uh, kind of a. Uh, this is just kind of a kicked can kind of bill, right? This is only a three-month extension. Is that correct? Well, it's just until December 11th, 
uh, which uh, uh, that we, we have to be working on our omnibus bill. Now, we've passed all of our bills in the House on this. We've passed them in the House, uh, except for maybe one. The Senate hasn't passed any. What will happen now is we'll proceed with what we have accomplished on the floor of the House. They'll post what their bills might be. Our appropriators will go to conference. And uh, we have a commitment from the appropriators, uh, both, sides of the, uh, both sides of the Capitol, uh, that they will work very hard to have an omnibus ready by just uh, to be finished. When I say finished, earlier ready, right. but finished by uh, December 11th. And that's how we right. will keep government. Well, let me jump to Justice it. Ginsburg and before. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Right. Let me, let me jump to Justice Ginsburg. Um, before we get to the controversy about the nomination, let's talk about Justice Ginsburg, the person. You knew her well, knew her for many years. Can you share with our audience um, just a, 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 any kind of reflection you have about her life and her work and your friendship? Well, I'm really heartbroken that she left us. Uh, she has been almost bionic in how she has staved off different diagnoses. Uh, I, I think one of the best compliments I ever received was from her when she said to me, and it has to be uh, you know, about a dozen years ago, she said, since you are my friend, I want you to know uh, that I have been diagnosed with cancer and it's going to be I'm going to make a public announcement, but I want it, since you are my friend, I wanted you to know so you can read about it in the paper. So I was kind of upset about hearing that. And she said, no, no, I'm going to be all right. I'm going to be all right. I mean, it was a serious diagnosis that she had, but I just love that she pressed it, prefaced both sentences with since you are my friend. Another episode that I love to tell about because I think it's so much Ruth Bader Ginsburg, -ish. I was getting on a plane, and then as it turned out, we were sitting right across from each other on the plane, and she was deeply engrossed in what she was doing. And then, but she didn't, you know, I said, hi, hi. I was, we were expecting, you know, a mad brace or something like that. <laughs> Nothing. She was just focused. And so for part of the flight, she was focused, focused. And then she was finished. She said, I'm working on my book. I'm just finishing my galley. I want you to read it, and, um, and 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 she was like a new person. You know, she was focused, and then she was friendly. And um, I said, no, I'm not going to read it. I'm going to buy the book. You give away reading a book. Make people buy the book. <laughs> but it was so funny to me to see her. And you know why? She's so effective. Because when she focused, she focused. But in the event, we have right. lost a giant. Let me, let me ask you. nobody could name who has done more right. uh, for the equality of women in our country than Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Uh, she was as tiny in, in petite in stature, huge in that impact, powerful, brilliant mind in the court, and uh, even in dissent powerful because her dissent in the Lily Ledbetter case, when the court ruled against women in the workplace, she wrote the dissent. It became the Lilly Ledbetter Law, the first bill of Barack Obama, President Obama signed, in, and it now is the law of the land, giving protections to women in the workplace. Right. L let me ask you about, so, so a year ago, you were at the Atlantic Festival. Um, I asked mm -hmm. you on stage. That's when we were allowed to be uh, near other people. Uh, okay. I asked you on, on stage um, if you were going to move to impeachment. Um, and you said it's a little too early to talk about that. Then you drove up to Capitol Hill and announced impeachment. Um, I wanted to stay on the word impeachment yeah. with you for one minute. You've suggested that in your quiver, in your quiver of arrows, um, uh, to stop Donald Trump from nominating uh, someone to the Supreme Court to replace Ruth Bader Ginsburg, that, you, the, that, that the word impeachment has been floated. Do you think it's possible to actually use, to try to impeach the president to slow down or stop this coming nomination? Oh, I, I don't ever remember saying that impeachment, of course, impeachment is always an arrow in a quiver. Uh, that would have been six months from now or 
anyway, but I, I, did, I didn't reference it in relationship to this. I think the most important thing that we can do in this regard, and I'm, I'm sad that we have to be talking about it before the great Ruth Bader Ginsburg is laid to rest, but that's the way it is, I guess. But the fact is, is that what, why the president is in such a rush is because he's in a hurry to overturn the Affordable Care Act. And he wants to do that. The, the oral arguments start November 10th, a week after the election. And he wants to get a, a, a justice in there in time for that so they can hear the arguments and vote on it. Uh, this it, People have to know what this means to them. Uh, yeah, they know that the Republicans are hypocritical. They said one thing and then another. Who cares? What they care about is what it means to them. And what it means to 150 million families in America is that no longer will they have the protection of the Affordable Care Act when it comes to a pre-existing medical condition. Because that's how many families in America, 150 million, uh, are subject to that. What it means to families with children on their policy, older children on their policy, especially now with the pandemic and kids not having jobs or insurance at work or anything, what it means to women, no longer being a woman is a pre-existing medical condition, and what it means in terms of Medicare and Medicaid and the rest of that. So people have to know what, what it means in their lives, and they do. And that's where I think our focus has to be. People have to vote, they have to vote for their health, and forgetting about all the machinations of Washington, D.C. from the standpoint of the House, because this is a Senate matter, but what it means and our effort will be about trying to protect the Affordable Care Act. Let me um, ask you this. Uh, is there anything the Democrats can do at this point to stop this nomination and vote from happening? Or is it a lost cause for the Democrats? Well, you'd have to ask the senators about that, because I usually do not go on to their terrain. Uh, but what I do know is what Abraham Lincoln said. Public sentiment is everything. With it, you can accomplish almost anything. Without it, practically nothing. And what I think it's important to do is to make sure uh, that people have a concern about losing a pre-existing condition or a child on their policy or Medicaid for, for uh, uh, long-term health care and the rest for seniors and, and the rest, that they have to make sure that their senators are aware of the fact, that they are aware of the fact that they're out to get them and to get their health. So again, vote, vote help. 20 states today are voting. 20 states, 10 states the day we lost uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, but 20 states today. So I want everybody to get out there and vote and make sure uh, that their senators now, you know, it's 42 days until the election. It's 43 days until the next election. And a lot of the Republican senators who are up the next time would do well to heed the voices and the votes of many of their constituents, uh, which uh, are, shall we say, more diverse in some of the district, the states coming up than in the states that are up now. Let me just go at this question one more time. You've talked about having a, a quiver full of uh, arrows. Do you have anything left to stop this? Or are you just assuming that, that this is going to happen? My, uh, my battlefield now is the court of public opinion. And, and the court of public opinion, people really know and care about the Affordable Care Act. It has never enjoyed the popularity never before enjoyed the popularity that it does now. But just going to people's kitchen tables where they have to worry about not only their health, but their financial health as is affected by medical bills. Uh, women, again, uh, women's health issues, are very important in the Affordable Care Act as well. So my, my arena is a court of public opinion. It far be it for me to interfere with whatever the actions are in the United States Senate on this, uh, in this battle. Uh, but I do think that, you know, there's a price to pay for ignoring, ignoring the needs of the American people. 
Yeah, but we're going to use an to, arrow. Um, I the, the, the sand right milestone. Here. We'll say that again. I just got a message. The Republicans may let the CR go on a voice vote. If so, do you want to call for a recorded vote? But leave it up to Steny. I am just saying. Steny is our floor manager, as you know. If you have to uh, run the House of Representatives from this interview, that's fine. <laughs> okay. Well, I just answered their question. I'm sorry. I just you wanted just, to you know You can just run, run, run the House right now. It's fine. No. <laughs> I'll just sit here while you run the house. It's fine. The, um, sad milestone this week, 200,000 200, dead um, in the pandemic. Um, I have a very simple question for you. How did this happen? It didn't have to happen. It didn't have to happen. And that's really one of the tragedies of it all. Uh, I'd rather look forward about how we can prevent it from continuing to happen. And that's why we passed four months ago the HEROES Act that has within it the strategic plan for how to stop the spread of the coronavirus. But the early denial, distortion, delay caused death. And that's a tragic thing because the scientists were telling us, the scientists were telling us what to do, wear your mask, have, keep your space, sanitation, all of that testing, tracing, treatment, all of that could have curtailed the growth of this. But the president said it's going to be a miracle, it's a hoax and all of that, and that's most unfortunate. But we do have a responsibility, having seen what happened, the country, the president has a responsibility to join with the scientists and us to say, this is how we're going to proceed. It could have been prevented, and that's the tragedy of it all. And you asked about Ruth Bader Ginsburg in the beginning and how much we will miss her and how valuable her life was and has been to our country and will continue to be. But 200,000 people have died. Families have lost their parent, their sibling, their loved one, their spouse, their child to this. The communities have lost valiant people who've been out there, first responders, healthcare providers. Today, I was on the mall with 20,000 flags, each representing 10 people who had died, their families, their communities. So again, the answer is science, 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 and science. But if you're anti-science and you're anti-governance, you don't want to pay attention to science because you may have to govern accordingly. And that is the failure of the Trump administration in this regard. But let us hope that they can see the light and obey Do science as we go forward. Do, do you hold President part, Trump directly responsible for at least part of these deaths? Absolutely. Do you hold him directly responsible for at least a portion of these deaths? There is no question. President of the United States, Donald Trump's failure to recognize and, and heed what science was telling him, uh, that he just want, didn't want it to appear uh, to happen on his watch, but it did. And to use the excuse that, well, I didn't want to cause a panic. No, you, you don't cause a panic by telling people what the solution will be, not that the problem doesn't exist. But again, I'd rather look forward. What can we do to prevent right. more death from happening? We have it in our HEROES Act. The, the funding there for the testing, tracing, treatment, good advice in terms of mask wearing, benefit, uh, sanitation, and the rest. And again, it takes money. And also, this has disproportionately hit, commu hit communities of color Black families and uh, Hispanic families are like four or five times more likely to go to the hospital with the coronavirus than white families. That's just immoral in our country. But again, right. look forward. What can we do to prevent more deaths from happening? And I'm excited about the prospect for a vaccine. And I would hope that the president would not have political intervention into the clinical trials and the official approvals that are necessary for a vaccine to go forward. 
I hope and pray it's an answer to our prayers, this vaccine. I think we want it to come. We want it to be safe and efficacious. And we want it not one day sooner than it is and not one day later than it is. But we want the American people to trust it. In order to trust it, the political henchmen at the White House have to keep out of the process and and, uh, casting doubt on the scientific worth of it. They're important scientists at the uh, uh, Food and Drug Administration who are blessed to have best minds working hard and long. Even the CEOs of the pharmaceutical companies have said they will not promote or support uh, a vaccine that is not, that does not, have not gone through the appropriate uh, clinical trials and approvals for it. The CDC, how demoralizing for all the wonderful scientists there to have the White House overturn the guidance given by the CDC scientifically uh, for what is needed to protect us from the spread of this virus is most unfortunate. But again, hopefully, as looking forward, they can keep their political hands off the science so that the competence is there. Because a vaccine will only work if people will take advantage of it. And we want them to have the trust in the scientists, even if they doubt the president. Madam Speaker, we're going to have to leave it there, but we uh, we hope to see you next year in better circumstances at the actual live Atlantic Festival. Um, although a lot of people are watching this, so that's that's one exciting aspect of this digital presentation. But we hope to see you uh, again, and I just wanted to thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you. Well, I look forward to it, and I thank you for what you're doing. I, I love this Atlantic Festival uh, because it's an exchange of ideas. Uh, where we can uh, be as candid as possible and as optimistic as possible as as we go forward. And again, I wish you a happy birthday. Thank you. Welcome co-founder of the COVID Tracking Project at The Atlantic and Atlantic staff writer, Alexis Madrigal. Hello, everyone. I am pleased to introduce Dr. Anthony Fauci, Director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. Dr. Fauci, welcome to the Atlantic Festival. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Good to be with you. Now that there are more than 200,000 Americans who have died from coronavirus, I want to take you back to the last week in March. Um, That was when you said that your middle of the road estimate um, was that it was likely that 100,000 to 200,000 Americans would die um, from COVID-19. How do you evaluate the U.S. response, given that we're beginning to move past the higher end of your early predictions? Well, I mean, obviously, the numbers speak for themselves. I mean, there have been, there have been some situations where things have worked well, and in some situations where they've not. One of the things that has always troubled me, you know, we got hit very badly, particularly in the early part when the northeastern part of the country, namely the New York metropolitan area, was accounting for, you know, almost half of all the infections, hospitalizations and deaths. And then when they turned around and came back down, they came down to a baseline that is low and stayed low, which is good. They've suffered terribly. uh, But right now they're in a they're in a good place. The situation that we then went into is one that is troublesome. And that is as we started to try and open the economy again, which I think we needed to do because you couldn't stay shut down indefinitely because of the effect not only on the economy, but on the economy, but other health issues. But what happened as we tried to open the country again, the states in their response to that were very variable. Some did not adhere strictly to the guidelines which we put forth, you know, the starting off where you have a certain checkpoint in the beginning, and then you go to phase one, phase two, and phase three. Some tried to, but the people in the states and in the cities really didn't pay attention and essentially went around without masks and congregated at bars. And you saw the baseline, which was at about 20,000 cases per day, which is unacceptably high. It went up gradually 30, 40, 50, and actually went up at one point to over 70,000 cases a day. Then as things started to turn around, where people realized that they really needed to do some of the things that we've been saying in a measured way, it came down to around 30 to 40. 
But right now, it's still stuck at between 35 and 40,000 a day. That's not good. No matter how you slice it, that's not good. Now, there are parts of the country yeah. that are doing very well. When you look at the map of the country, we're a big country. We're heterogeneous geographically, demographically, and otherwise. But the other things we've done differently is the difference in how we've responded. And there are parts of the country that are doing well. We should make them be the models. But there are others you're starting to see an uptick in test positivity. And we know from historical observation retrospectively that when that happens, you're going to have a surge. So as I've said so many times, Alexis, that the fact is that if you do the simple public health measures, universal wearing of masks, physical distancing, avoiding crowds, doing things outdoor more than indoors if possible, and washing your hands, that sounds like it's very simplistic, but we know when we do that consistently, we prevent surges and we turn them around. So the concern I have okay. now, I'm giving more of an answer than you want, it is that we're entering into the fall and into the winter. And that means there's going to be more indoor things than outdoor things. And going into that situation, I would like to have seen the baseline of where we are, the daily number of infections come way, way down and not be stuck at around 30 to 40,000 per day, which is where it is right now. So it seems like looking out into the winter, there's really two very different stories you could tell right now. One is that, you know, the baseline is too high. We're heading into the winter, which people have been worried about the uh, onset of flu season. The other is, well, you know, we have a lot more testing, possibly vaccines, which we're going to talk about later. There is a sort of hopeful story that you could tell about the, the winter as well. So where are we, do you think? Is this sort of the beginning of the end or is it really the beginning of, of a new wave? Well, again, we, we, we continue to talk about the new wave. And I keep telling people, you know, that's based on the model of the 1918 pandemic, which had cases in the spring of 1918. And then things essentially disappeared in the summer. And then when the fall came, we did have a second wave in 1918 because you went from essentially nothing to an enormous wave that was far worse than the original outbreak, which occurred in the spring of 1918. That's not comparable right now. We've got to get out of the situation we're in right now, which means you don't talk about first wave, second wave. We're looking at 40,000 new cases per day. That's unacceptable, and that's what we've got to get down before we go into the more problematic winter. But to the point that you made about vaccines, that is critical, and that's a good news story thus far, and I'm cautiously optimistic about that because we have three vaccine candidates in phase three trial already. A fourth one will very shortly go into phase three trial. And they're involving a large number of individuals, anywhere from 30,000, some trials are 44,000, another one is 60,000. So we hope that by the time we get into the late fall and early winter, November and December, we will know whether a vaccine is safe and effective. There's never a guarantee, Alexis, that you're gonna get a safe and effective vaccine, but I'm cautiously optimistic looking at the initial data from some of the phase one trials, that in fact, we will be successful. How successful we'll be, the only way you know is look at the results of the clinical trial. The other good news is that even as we're doing the testing, we've made a major investment in hundreds of millions of dollars the federal government has to make doses of the vaccine so that they are ready when the decision is made whether a vaccine is safe and effective. So you don't have to wait months. So if we get an answer, let's say November, December, it's possible it could be earlier. I think it's going to be likely November, December. We can then start vaccinating people, starting with the healthcare workers, starting with the vulnerables. Vulnerables, I mean yeah. the elderly and those with underlying conditions. So that's a good so news. Heard... Potential. Yeah. Yeah. 
I've listened to dozens of interviews interviews with you over the last six months, and you've definitely become pro progressively more optimistic about the vaccine timeline. And it really does seem like the vaccine development and production program, Operation Warp Speed, um, is a bright spot in the American response. How much do you think that that program specifically has sped up vaccine development and eventually distribution? Okay, so l let me backtrack for a second, Alexis, and correct you on something. I haven't become sure. progressively more optimistic. In January of this year, when I was asked, when do I think we might have a vaccine that we could start? And go back to my quotes. Some of them you've heard me. I said about a year with them now. So a year from January 2020, uh, 2019 is December. So I haven't changed <laughs> anything. Okay. So let's keep that for the record. The other thing is that this this issue of Operation uh, Warp Speed, um, I think we what we need to clarify, and I'd appreciate the opportunity to do this, that the sure. sound of that I never liked. Warp Speed, it kind of makes it look like you're rushing things recklessly. It's not. What it is, is that we've done things in a very fast pace based fundamentally on two things, on a utilization and taking advantage of scientific advances and technological advances in what we call vaccine platform technology, where you can go from the sequence of a virus, which we knew on January 10th, to going into a phase one trial within a couple of months, which has never been done. And there's not sacrificing safety nor scientific integrity. And then seven months later, we're in a phase three trial. And the fact that we are in a phase three trial now is not a testimony to cutting corners, but utilizing the technological advances that we have. So that's the reason why I sound optimistic, because the things that I said in January, which would be dependent on getting us a year later to have vaccines, fortunately for us, have worked out. The phase one trials looked good. They've induced the response in individuals that would be comparable to what you would get from natural infection. Namely, it induced a response you would predict would be protective. That's always a good prognostic sign for whether the vaccine is going to work or not. It's not going to tell you how effective it is, but it's strongly hinting that it will be effective. That's the reason why I might sound more up about it, because the results that we have actually do look good. Sure. Um, I want to ask you this uh, directly, just so you have a chance to answer it. I mean, I know many times you've said that the you know approval and distribution of vaccines will be guided by science. But do you think that the announcement of a vaccine will come on the administration's political timeline? No, no. And, and, and I could tell you why that's the case, Alexis, um, is that the data will determine the announcement. So each of these trials has a data and safety monitoring board, which is a group of people who are qualified scientists, who are qualified uh, 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 ethicists, who are qualified statisticians, who will look at the data at intermittent times and determine one of four things. A, they'll look and they'll say, you know, you don't have enough data to say it's working or it's not working, continue the study. Or it'll look and say, you know, the way that's distributed, you're never going to get an answer. So you might as well just it's a futile study. Or they may say, wait a minute, we're seeing more infections in the vaccine group than the placebo group. So we better stop this because it's a dangerous trial or what we're hoping and what usually happens with a successful vaccine They'll say, we're starting to see that the data is showing that the vaccine is working. The only person who sees that data is the unblinded statistician on the data safety monitoring board, who's beholden to no one, not to the FDA, not to the president, not to me, and not to the company. When they look at the data, and if it looks good, then they tell the company, then the company makes the decision, shall I go to the FDA and apply either for an emergency use authorization or actually for licensure, which we call a BLA, a biological license application. The FDA then 
examines that and looks at it with an advisory board, those data become public and transparent so that scientists like myself, my colleagues, people like Dr. Collins, the director of NIH, will be able to see that data. So any decision about whether or not you're going to approve a vaccine is going to be very transparent. It, it, I mean, if, if someone tries to make an end run, that's going to be clearly obvious. Got it. You know, and there, the reason I ask these things is, you know, there have been a series of kind of confusing, concerning stories on changing CDC guidance, on HHS messaging, even sort of direct political editing of CDC's morbidity and mortality weekly report. And I think the question that's on a lot of people's minds, people trust you. You're the most trusted person on coronavirus. But where else should Americans go for, for information they can trust? You know, I think fundamentally, uh, it's been unfortunate what happened with the try and manipulate of the CDC. There was an individual in the department who, as no, is past history. That person is no longer there. The person who was trying to influence the CDC and even me with emails is gone. I never listened to the person. Just don't bother me. Get out of here. I mean, that's the way it was. So I think we could put that behind us right now. So I would trust the CDC and I would trust the FDA. The FDA commissioner has made it very clear that he is going to make sure that the in the trenches scientists who look at these types of things all the time, that's what they do for a living. They're going to be the ones that are going to be making the recommendation. You know, when HIV AIDS sort of first emerged, there was obviously a lot of fear mongering and misinformation. So these things are obviously not new. But this time around, there's kind of an entire ecosystem, mostly on the far right, that's really downplayed the pandemic, tried to cast doubt on, you know, the number of people being infected and dying. What effect do you think that those forces have had on the course of the pandemic in this country? Uh, it's been detrimental, Alexis, because what the what the general public needs is a message that's consistent and that they can believe. And what's happened, unfortunately, and, and I think this, you, you have to be asleep not to realize this, that we are living in a very divisive society right now. There's no doubt about that. That's not my opinion. That's just obvious of what we see. It's politically charged also. And what's happened is that public health issues and public health recommendations have taken on a we versus them approach, getting back to the point where getting people to wear masks, it was like a, a statement not to wear mm -hmm. a mask. People don't, people, as you know, it's public knowledge now, have been threatening me as a public health person, literally threatening me and my family because I'm saying we should be doing public health things like wearing a mask, physical distancing, as if I'm doing something that is harmful to them. They interpret it as the public health measure is hurting them. No, the virus is hurting us, not the public health measures. The public health measures really should be looked upon as a vehicle or a pathway to reopen the economy and to get the country back and to get employment back. It shouldn't be looked upon as an obstacle. So what I'm talking about is not shutting down. Put shutting down away. We know what the detrimental aspect of that is on a lot of people. I'm talking about trying to open the economy, but doing it in a measured, careful way, according to the guidelines that we carefully put forth. If we did that, Alexis, I'm almost certain we would not have seen those surges of cases that brought us up to 70,000 a day and have now plateaued down at 30 to 4,000 a day. I believe if we do that, we're going to see things turning around. And I know because if you look at that big map of our beautiful country, there are certain areas of the country that are doing really well. We need to make those be the models. Great. Thank you, Dr. Foucher. We're going to have to leave it there. Thank you so much for joining us today and for all of your service to the country. Thank you, Alexis, for having me. I appreciate it.
The Atlantic Festival is brought to you through the generous support of Facebook, Genentech, Hewlett Packard Enterprise, Walton Family Foundation, Allstate, Eli Lilly and Company, U.S. Bank, AARP, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, ExxonMobil, John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, Nestle Waters North America, and PayPal. Here is Atlantic Live contributor and the host of WNYC's All of It, Allison Stewart. Hollywood has come a long way in terms of diversity, but it also has a long way to go in terms of inclusion and breadth of representation. Someone who's been at the forefront of this issue is the Emmy and Tony Award-winning actor, performer, and singer. I'm going to throw activist in there, too. Billy Porter, you know you enjoy him as Pray Tell on Pose. And Billy, welcome to the Atlantic Festival. Thank you. Thank you for having me. A few days ago, many people might have seen during the Emmys a PSA that you were... I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. There's just a delay, so it's all good. Yes. Okay. Okay. A few days ago, during the Emmys, people may have seen a PSA that you were part of with Lin-Manuel Miranda and Daniel Kim and other actors of color, just asking Hollywood to, you know, do better and to see you as people. And you had this one very strong line in it. You said, we are more than a splash of color on your white canvas. What does that mean to you? And why was that meaningful to you, that line? Well, you know, I came out in 1985. I graduated from college in 1991, Carnegie Mellon, uh, the drama program at Carnegie Mellon. And when I arrived, there were three archetypes that a black man could be. James Earl Jones, the patriarch, Denzel Washington, the sex symbol, Eddie Murphy, the genius clown. And um, all of them were straight sometimes violently so. And so for me to find a place inside of that space for a queer black person of color, you know, was a really hard thing to find. And I really had to lean into this idea that I was going to be at best the second banana, the third banana, the magical, mm -hmm. you know, fairy clown that sprinkles, you know, healing dust mm -hmm. over all the white people. You know, like that was the <clears throat> only thing that was possible for a very long time. Um, that has changed now. Um, due in large part to um, myself and my generation, um, you know, saying no, we are more than that. We are full human beings mm -hmm. that you have to take a look at and see um, for real. Um, you know, it's a, it is a new day. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we have made a lot of, of good headlines. Many of the arts and cultural institutions have had this reckoning this year. The book industry had the hashtag publishing paid me, which revealed the disparity between black authors, people of color who are authors and white authors. A stage, We See You White American Theater is a group that's really been calling folks out from museums, all the big cultural institutions. So these, these groups that I just mentioned are people of color who have come together to make demands. At this point, what do the gatekeepers, the mostly white gatekeepers, need to do? What's a good first step? Well, the first step is to listen. Um, the first step mm -hmm. is to reflect inward. You know, I had a old friend, creative friend of mine sort of approached me 
a couple of weeks back. Um, in a sort of chastising tone because I hmm. chose to speak my truth and that bristled his feathers. And what I said was, and this is what I say to all, is that the caste system has created a space where we as people of color are always on the bottom. We have always been on the bottom. And we have always had to wait for people, very often white people, in positions of power to say, yes, we let you in. It's a new day. Mm -hmm. And it's time for those positions that are filled those positions of power that are filled by mainly white people all the time in history to be finally filled with different types of people, whether it's women, whether it's people of color, whatever it is, we mm -hmm. as the outsiders, we as the, the, um, the not dominant caste in the culture, have to be able to mm -hmm. be in positions of power so that we can green light projects, so that we can um, usher in a different type of storytelling based on our unique history. So the people who are the gatekeepers mm -hmm. have to be willing to relinquish their power, share their power. That was what so give it over. Mm -hmm. Give it over to people who can usher in a new way of telling stories, a new group of people. You know, I think one of the things that Pose really does is mm -hmm. The difference is, is that we are the tellers of our own stories. We have to be able to tell our own stories. We have to be able, we mm -hmm. have to be given the power to tell our own stories. That's what's so interesting. I, I thought when Serena Williams' husband, I'm going to call him, Alexis Ohanian, stepped down from the board, I believe it was of Reddit, and he said, you know what, fill my position with a person of color. That's what needs to happen. And it's, it's we need more leaders like that, in my opinion. I know I'm interviewing you, but I'm putting my two cents in there. Yeah, no, 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 no. It's, it's you know, it's a hard As we space to be, you know, because it requires... Mm -hmm. Um, people in positions of power to yield, yield, for real. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Tara. What, what is something that has made you feel optimistic? What is something that's made you feel really optimistic? Like this, this moment about the business is a or movement about the world. and is going to continue on. About the business or about the world? Let's stick with the business first and then we'll talk about the world. Great. So in the business, as Billy Porter, the actor, shifting during COVID into Billy Porter, the writer, the content creator, pitching my own mm -hmm. stuff. I literally said this this afternoon. It has been so inspiring to show up on Zoom and to be pitching to these companies my own content, whether it's Hulu, whether it's Netflix, you know, HBO Max, mm -hmm. Peacock, ABC, blah, 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 whatever it is, to see these rooms filled with diverse faces. I'm seeing women. I'm seeing Latins. 
I'm seeing black people. I'm seeing Asian people. I'm seeing Muslim people. I'm seeing Middle Eastern people. Like I'm seeing, not Muslim, Middle, Middle Eastern people. I'm seeing, you know, mm -hmm. like I have been mm -hmm. gobsmacked. I literally had to say it out loud today. I was like, you know what? I'm not trying to suck up, but like there were three people in the room. They were all women and they were all women of color. I was like, okay, thank you. Like that is new. <laughs> Let's honor mm -hmm. this. Let's honor this moment. You know, let's really take this in because those are people in positions of power who now can green light projects that would otherwise not have been greenlit. Mm -hmm. Because the white people who were in positions of power did not understand the story, did not understand the importance of telling that story. It's really powerful. And I'm really inspired by that. In the macro, mm -hmm. in the world, what has been inspiring to me is to watch mm -hmm. um, the young people come together and understand that it's we the people that make the difference. You know, to see the protests and the protests, I, I, who was it? I can't remember who it was, mm -hmm. but it was, it was somebody older and black you know, from like, you know, civil rights movement era. And they were like, I showed up to the place and it was mostly white people. You know, like that was, you know, it's, it's such a, it's <laughs> inspiring. It's like, yeah, I always say, I always say, okay. joking, but it's kind of truth because truth comes out in jest. White people are mad now. So maybe something might happen. There's truth in that. There's truth in that, that I can mm -hmm. say now and people will not, you know, people will not like come after me for it because it's the truth. It's the truth. And it's inspiring to see. It's like finally our allies, our progressive allies mm -hmm. understand the depth with which this racism caste system right. exists in our culture. Finally, white people are getting it. You know, one of the things that I, that I was really concerned about was that social media had created a space where our tool, which is the media, had almost become defunct, in my opinion, because it's so much mm -hmm. that everybody was like, I felt like everybody was desensitized to these images, these unacceptable images. There was a desensitization mm -hmm. that, it, that happened that our tool, which is the media, was no longer working. And then George Floyd and those eight minutes and... Mm. Mm -hmm. whatever many seconds, 26, 46, whatever it was, I can't remember. But like, all of a sudden, we got our tool back. All of a sudden, there's outrage. All of a sudden, we're mm -hmm. literally watching what we've been saying for 400 years, 200 years. Get your white knees off our necks. Without consequence. It was there, mm -hmm. plain as day. And finally, people saw it. Finally, white people were like, oh, shoot. They might be telling the truth. Mm -hmm. Hmm. I, when we sat down, I noticed behind you, it's National Voter Registration Day, by the way, everybody. And behind Billy, it says vote. You've been very, there you go. <laughs> why, I think I, I know the obvious reason why it was important for you to be politically active this year, but I really want to know from your heart why you had to be politically active this year. Well, first and foremost, I've always been politically active. I... I'm first generation 
post civil rights movement. So when they gave us the day off from school on voting days, it was not a day off for me. My mother woke me up, made us breakfast, and mm. made us walk with her to the polling place. People died for our right to be here and do this. I have always been political. The receipts are actually online. Always from the time that I came here, I've been mm -hmm. political. It's just now I have a, a platform where people are actually listening in a way where they didn't need to listen before. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm active because I've always been active. But simultaneously, right. American democracy is on the ballot. Period. Period. Mm -hmm. We're not being hyperbolic. We have seen what it is. We have all the information. Americans like to talk about how, how much better we are than this. We're better than this. We are not, nor mm -hmm. have we ever, been better than this. We have tried. We have succeeded sometimes, and we have not succeeded mm -hmm. sometimes. We are in a yes. moment right now where yes. we're not succeeding. We're not. And we and have we a have choice to vote. Today. And we have to vote. We Everybody have to vote. vote. Billy Porter. There's a choice to make. There's a choice. It is so we good to have you. On November 3rd. It is so good to see. <laughs> we will see on November 3rd. You got, you got the last you word in there, my friend. Billy Porter. Better than this. Thank you. Billy, thank you. Thank you for your thank passion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank the Atlantic Festival <laughs> for seeing an artist and understanding that an artist, we have power. We are here. Don't discount us because we sing and we act. What is that? Mm -hmm. Everybody has a voice. Everybody, no matter what we do for a living, we have a voice in this democracy. And we must use it. And now, an Atlantic Ideas File with Arthur Brooks. As the weeks and months slip by, we're figuring out that the pandemic is less a temporary affliction and it's becoming more of a forced transition from one way of life to another. Our jobs, our personal lives, they're shifting. And in many cases, they might not return to what we thought of as normal. The only certainty is that even if a cure comes along in the coming years and months, the future, it won't look like the past. You may never go back to work like before. Dating may never be the same. Your alma mater might go broke or disappear. Will you hug your friends or even shake hands? Maybe not. Transitions are one of the hardest aspects of life whether they be a death in the family, a period of unemployment, a move to a new city, or a new way of life with COVID. These things force us between states of life and identities. They raise the question, who am I? That can be emotionally destabilizing. Well, I have some good news today. You see, even difficult, unwelcome transitions like this are usually seen differently in retrospect than they are in real time. Research shows that we tend to see important past events, even painful ones, as net positives over time. Why is this? The reason is that painful transitions yield the greatest understanding of purpose in our lives. People learn the most about life and thus derive meaning from periods of pain and struggle that make us temporarily unhappy. To quote one study from 2013 that surveyed a national sample of almost 400 adults, quote, Worry, stress, and anxiety were linked to higher meaningfulness, but lower happiness. The lessons from all this are clear. Transitions like what we're experiencing today are inevitable, painful, but a net positive part of life, unless we waste them by trying to resist. If we lean into even difficult transitions like today, they will yield meaning, creativity, and personal growth. Please welcome Atlantic contributing writer, Jamel Hill. 
Good evening, everyone. Well, this has been a, a summer unlike any I've certainly experienced, and I have a feeling that a lot of people watching right now have gone through the same thing. Uh, the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor at the hands of police sparked nationwide protests and, of course, renewed demands for police reform. Uh, we need to contextualize this moment in American history and explore how we move forward. So with that in mind, please help me welcome Alicia Garza, principal at Black Futures Lab and co-founder of the Black Lives Matter movement. Welcome, Alicia. Um, you know, so I remember, thank you for being here. Um, I'm old enough to remember uh, when you first co-founded the Black Lives Matter movement that saying Black Lives Matter was a cuss word. Fast forward mm -hmm. to this summer where you saw, um, based off polls, that 60% of Americans actually supported uh, this movement. Seeing how everybody has come around, if that's the way you want to put it, um, does this feel like a validating moment for you to see where everybody is with the movement right now? Well, first and foremost, Jamel, let me just say, hi, love you, big fan, so cool <laughs> to be here with you. Second of all, hey to all the Atlantic watchers, um, and thanks for having me. It does feel like a full circle moment that is leading into another moment that is unknown. I too am old enough to remember when Black Lives Matter and saying it was seen as political suicide for many uh, politicians who uh, were actually being called to respond to a movement that had transformed the landscape of this country for at least two years prior to the last presidential election. We had a hard time getting candidates even to just say Black Lives Matter, much less talk about what policies they would advance to ensure that Black Lives Mattered, not just in Congress, but in our cities and in our states, in our homes and in our workplaces all across the nation. And so it is interesting now to see such an about face. I mean, at the last Democratic National Convention, you really couldn't get through five minutes without hearing BLM, seeing BLM. But I will say that we're faced with some of the similar challenges, which is that we really want to see policies that will advance and enrich Black communities that have been decimated and attacked by a lack of leadership, a lack of political will, and a lack of clarity around how it is that we eliminate systemic racism from every structure and process in our lives. That is what I think this movement is hungry for right now. It's why the movement has been calling for the uh, introduction of the Breathe Act, which literally lays out uh, a la 1964 Civil Rights Act style, how it is that we divest from a punishment economy and invest in a caring economy that rebuilds the infrastructure our communities need to be powerful. So I think it's a full circle moment, but again, there's more that I think is to come. And some of it really relies on the courage of leaders in this moment to ensure that we don't waste this um, beautiful kind of reckoning and opening up in our country. See, I, I can understand why you would be cautiously optimistic because we know sometimes when the public uh, support is not there, that suddenly you see those same people who stood in that corner and stood behind you, they're much further behind than they used to be. To that end, and I know it may seem like I might be undercutting the last question that I asked you, we've also seen post Jacob Blake, Kenosha, Wisconsin, some support for Black Lives Matter has dipped a little bit. Um, the, according to the last Pew poll, now support for Black Lives Matter is now down to 55%. What do you attribute the decline to? And what does that say about where the movement is right now in terms of how it's being looked upon by Americans? I'm glad you asked the question. It's not undercutting at all. I think it's a really clear picture, right, of what we're up against. I think the reason that there has been a slight dip in support for the Black Lives Matter movement and Black Lives Matter as an organization is because we are facing a powerful media machine that has been building itself for the last 30 years. And they are able to make lies and slander go viral in a matter of minutes. How do I know this? Because I was just attacked last week. There were articles that were going all around social media saying that the BLM co-founder had teamed up with a 
pro-China communist organization. Um, and that essentially in these articles, right, they make me seem like I'm the Wizard of Oz. They make me sound like I'm building some huge empire to take over the world. And I'm chuckling about it because it's ridiculous. But when I stop laughing about it, I'm concerned because the reality is that media machine is reaching millions and millions of people around the world in a second. And unfortunately, what they put out in their machines, they stick. And so, sure, I can just tell you, I was uh, in San Francisco the other day uh, filming something with my sister, Angela Rye, and we talked to a group of kids at one of the rec centers. And she asked them, you know, have you heard of the Black Lives Matter movement? And they got all excited and said, yes. And then she said, do you know who founded this movement? And the kids said, China. OK, so that is an example of how fast these kinds of lies can carry. And so I think that part of what we have to take into account here is that the reason that the right and the extreme right in particular has been so effective is because they have been focused on building infrastructure in order to build and maintain political power. What they know is that their values are not majoritarian values. They cannot um, tip the scales in terms of the majority of the country really following their agenda. So what they use instead is coercion. And part of that coercion is using their vast media infrastructure to slander and denigrate our movement, saying things like Black Lives Matter protesters are coming to your home and getting ready to take the things that you've worked hard for and demand your allegiance to the movement. Everybody knows over the last seven years, nobody's done that. Black Lives Matter doesn't do that, but it doesn't matter. It's enough to continue to stoke fear and anxiety in a country that is already deeply anxious about the precarious position that we're in. So that's what I would attribute that dip in support to. And I would say, if we want to turn that around, it means we have to mobilize like we never have before and unleash a tsunami of our majoritarian values on November 3rd. Um, if it makes you feel any better, they thought Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was a communist too. So uh, maybe uh, there is something to be said for carrying that label. Amazing how history repeats itself because he also faced a lot of disinformation um, as well. And of course, during a time when there was no internet and uh, it's amazing the themes that still carry forward that you have to face. And to that end, something else that he and the civil rights movement also had to combat was this idea that the protests were more uh, hurtful than they were helpful. Um, we have seen a lot of attention being placed on what's going on in Portland, what happened in Kenosha, more of these violent outbreaks. Uh, these anomalies have been cast as what has been the majority sort of thesis of the movement. So how do you grapple with the fact that there are some who are not necessarily a part of this movement who are working diligently to undercut the things that you you try to build how do you balance this mm -hmm. i love this question jamel because i think it's one that's not asked enough quite frankly activists and organizers on the ground who have risk their lives during a pandemic to really call attention to the ongoing injustice that happens in our communities have been saying to us since the protests for Ahmaud Arbery, since the protests for George Floyd in Minneapolis, and certainly all the way through, through Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade and others, activists and organizers and protesters have been saying that really where the chaos is coming from is white militias and white nationalists who are showing up to these demonstrations to undermine the legitimacy of these protests that are legitimate protests and that are bringing to bear uh, a challenge and a deep problem that this country has never fully reckoned with. And we're not covering that enough. I think the first time I started to even see stories about this was just two weeks ago when white nationalists uh, in the daytime and white militias in the daytime uh, came to counter protest Black Lives Matter protesters uh, in Louisville, Kentucky um, over the murder of Breonna Taylor. And they came fully armed with flags and bulletproof vests. And even still, even within that, the coverage was more about was there gonna be a skirmish rather than 
what does it mean that that white militias feel that it is okay to operate in the light of day when fundamentally they've it, they're essentially a paramilitary force. They're a vigilante force that this president is not even dog whistling. He's bullhorning and saying, you have a role to play in leading this country. That's what we saw in Kenosha with the 17 year old child who was driven to a protest by his mother with guns and who ended up killing two people who literally jumped in front of another protester to keep them from being shot. That's the state of this country right now, and it is the impact and effect of leadership that has failed to lead in a moment where so much of who we are is coming apart. We deserve to have a leader, regardless of political party, that wants to weave this country back together. And I think we're very clear that that leader is not the one that we have right now. I will also say that there's a danger in not covering uh, the actual story of what's happening on the ground. It means something that there are white nationalists, white uh, supremacists, and white militias that are um, openly kind of patrolling cities and communities looking for fights. I think we need to kind of pay attention to uh, not just the anticipation of what could happen, but I think we need to be focused on telling the American people the long and sordid history of the use of racial terror in trying to suppress social movements for racial, economic, and gender justice. That's the real story that we should be telling today. And, and often with the blessing, uh, if not complete tacit approval or tepid approval of the police, because this is happening in full view of them and they don't seem very motivated uh, to stop any of this when the violence is enacted against peaceful protesters. Um, speaking of the police, the buzzword has been defund the police and in some cases dismantle the police. There's been a lot of conversation about what that word actually means. What does defund mean to you? Mm -hmm. Well, defund means take resources away from the punishment economy. That's what it means. We know what defund means. Our communities have been being defunded for, de de for decades. And what we, the way that we see that is that so many of our communities right now don't have a full service hospital or a full service grocery store. In my community, uh, you know, we have uh, tent cities sprawled all across my city that weren't there three and four years ago, but they are flourishing today. At the same time, my city, we're one of the only jurisdictions in the country, and I'm in Oakland, California, that pays for a school police department in addition to our regular police department. We are also one of the top five cities in the nation to pay out exorbitant amounts of money to families who have been uh, who have lost their loved ones to police violence. And then, of course, finally, my city, like many other cities, uh, invests 40 percent or more of our general budget in policing when we have schools that are closing, when we have people who are living on the streets, when we lack access to the things that we need to live well. And so I don't want to mince words here. I think, you know, we've heard from all the pollsters that defund is not popular. And I don't think that that's actually the point. We all know what defund means. And I think what's happening right now is that we're having a reckoning about what public safety can, should, and must look like. And I think what we're learning is that, you know, for me, my whole life, I've been told that police are here to keep you safe. But time and time again, and now on video with the rise of technology, we're seeing that actually, in some cases, police are a terrorizing force in communities. We're also seeing that police uh, departments are funded for um, extraneous things, uh, again, designed to um, uh, give the impression, right, that there are war zones that police are out here in, um, you know, and that they're solving all of those problems. I see police in my community driving down the street in tanks that I know cost a lot of money. But I can also tell you that over the last 10 years, crime has been dropping steadily across the nation. There is no explosion of crime. And so we have to ask ourselves, why are we investing so many resources uh, in, in 
a punishment economy that isn't necessarily curtailing crime. It's just taking resources away from the things that people need to live well. And that's the best deterrent to crime that there is, making sure that people have housing, making sure that people have jobs that pay a living wage and that they have access to a union, making sure that people have full service grocery stores. All of those things are ways to ensure that our communities are well and living with dignity. So defund means take money away from the punishment economy and invest it in an economy that cares for ourselves and our families. Yeah, it's uh, amazing. I don't know if the law enforcement community has thought of this way, is that by defunding, some would say that you're actually trying to make their jobs a little bit easier because they wouldn't have to deal with so many problems that they aren't actually equipped to uh, deal with or trained to deal with for that matter. Uh, I hope this uh, moment in time that we're all in, that it it continues um, because we need to kind of sit in this for a while. These problems didn't certainly get here overnight, so it will not take overnight to fix them. But with people like you, uh, Alicia, I'm sure uh, we all feel a little bit better that these problems will at least be tackled, thought about, and there will be some kind of reasonable discourse around them. So I want to thank you for joining us here at Atlantic Fest. Thank you for being here with us and for dropping a little bit of knowledge. Enjoy your evening. Thank you for having me. Bye. The Atlantic Festival is brought to you through the generous support of Facebook, Genentech, Hewlett Packard Enterprise, Walton Family Foundation, Allstate, Eli Lilly and Company, U.S. Bank, AARP, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Exxon Mobil, John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, Nestle Waters North America, and PayPal. Next, Atlantic contributing writer and co-host of Showtime's The Circus, Alex Wagner. In 2016, approximately 58% of Americans voted in the presidential election. In a bitterly divided nation, what is it going to take to vastly improve engagement in the political process and get more people out to vote? To examine this more closely, I am joined by the founders of the new civic engagement website, A Starting Point. Actor and producer Chris Evans, Mark Casson, and Joe Chiani. Gentlemen, thank you for joining me. Thank you for having thank us. You. Um, so, my, I want to start first with you, Chris. Uh, given the fact that you have played most notoriously, famously, into great box office success, Captain America, um, did did some of that character seep into your veins? How is it that you? You came around to wanting to do something like this. Was it just an unwavering sense of patriotism? Tell me a little bit about the genesis of this project. Sure. I mean, it's it's nice to try and uh, attribute some of it to the parallels of the character. That's that's, that's not quite the reason. Uh, but 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 no, it's always been about just trying to to help with the platform I I'm lucky enough to have. And uh, for a long time, I've been using Twitter. You know, and you, you play on that one string, and you kind of just kind of shout your own opinions, your own narrative. And it just started to feel like that wasn't having, um, not that it wasn't having an impact, but but I, I think you can cast a much wider net if you encourage people to actually get involved in the political process themselves. That's Those are the numbers that are staggering. When you look at how many people vote in general elections, it's, it's just not enough. There's, there's no way that government can work properly if it can't accurately reflect who we are as a nation. So this, this project was designed to try and create uh, engagement. You have fairly lofty goals, among them to create an informed, responsible, and empathetic citizenry and to reduce partisanship and promote respectful discourse. From your mouth to God's ears, guys, I, I wonder, though, in this moment and this week in particular, when our country feels like it has been cleaved in two, do you think the American public wants to come together. It really feels so tribal, the partisanship right now. How do you assess kind of where we are in the context of what you're trying to do with a starting point? I, I think they do. I, I think they really do. I mean, I, it, it may seem a little misleading if you only go on social media and read some of the comments. Typically, those are the people on the most extreme ends of each party who are the loudest. So it can feel like we're fraying at the edges because the vitriol is at an all-time high. But the truth is, I think the majority of people are a little exhausted with that vitriol or are looking to find commonality or looking to make progress. Uh, they just aren't always as vocal as the rest. 
I totally agree, but I also think that there's not a lot of ways for people to feel engaged without being encouraged to show what they don't agree on. You know, and one of the things yeah. we want to do is make a place where there was no reward mechanism for people to galvanize for or against. You could get closer to the electorate without, you know, getting prizes for taking them down because we don't have any message boards or likes or dislikes. And so, you know, we're not here to solve everything, but, I, you know, our experience has been not as negative as people would have thought in terms of the divisiveness. Uh, and, and hopefully our platform uh, will be representative of that. I respect what you're saying about social media, but I also have spent the last several months, the better part of the last year, traveling around the country to Wisconsin and Pennsylvania. I'm going to North Carolina tomorrow. And I have to tell you, it isn't just social. I mean, people are accosting each other in grocery stores over something like a mask mandate. And what I've seen is the catharsis of anger. It just feels like we are letting it out. And what you're asking people to do is kind of bring it back into a very rational, reasoned conversation. How do you think we got to this point? I mean, I guess, and, and how do you think we return to civic engagement? It sounds so throwback in a lot of ways, right? But it feels like that part of American society society has really atrophied in the course of the last 10 or 20 years. Sure. I mean, I, I, I have my own personal opinions. I, I do not think we have a leader who has encouraged uh, the, the, the perspective of, of us being one country, one people. You know, I, I don't think we have a leader who has encouraged, you know, looking for those commonalities. But beyond that, you know, we're still in the Internet's infancy. You know, this this proliferation of misinformation has only exacerbated, as you said, this kind of tribal perspective. And everyone has retreated to their corners, uh, choosing to read and believe the information that they search, search out. You know what I mean? So, so uh, it's, it's, it's only kind of encouraging these kind of us against them mentalities. I think that people, you know, we're not the answer to all of it. We're not asking people to suddenly change, you know, their nature or asking them to completely operate in a different way. We're just asking them to engage in a simple way. And to start mm -hmm. somewhere. Uh, and a lot of times people go to their corners because they believe that's where they live. And if there was a way to start to s hear conversations that may not be what they agree with, but are representative of pe people's points of view that are your fellow countrymen, perhaps we could create a little bit more empathy and then a more productive dialogue. But we're not answering the whole thing. When Obama became president, I think it gave rise to a lot of people saying, hey, why is a black man our president? And I think you got some of that racism coming to the surface. And then it gave life to this Trump world that we live in. And as Mark said, I think, and Chris said, the tone at the top has gotten really bad. And it's giving rise to this vitriol like we've never had. Usually tone at the top like, has been keeping us back to our ideals of what our nation is about. So uh, there's a way to put it back in place. And, you know, I'm, I'm grateful for Chris leading this and us trying to bring back that civic engagement, us trying to bring a good tone at the top. And hopefully this election, people will get out there and vote and instead of protesting the day after. Chris, you, you know, we talk about leadership from the top. The president is, of course, the titular head of the Republican Party. There are Republicans in Congress, some of whom stand, a lot of whom stand with him. Um, despite whatever their private feelings may be, you went to Capitol Hill to record. You've been the person, for people who do not know, those videos on the website, the person behind the camera is you. Um, can you tell me a little bit about your experience? You know, Mr. Evans goes to Washington, D.C. What was the reception like? Was it as good or bad? Was the evil as pronounced? <laughs> was the good as pronounced as what we see in a Marvel superhero film, not to belabor the metaphor, but tell me a little bit about sure. how you, you manage that, that new landscape. Sure. Uh, it was, you know, every trip to DC was, was very encouraging, you know, meeting people and, and, you know, I, I think we all just assume that politics is this, this machine that doesn't work anymore. Or, um, doesn't even try to, but, but, but when you meet the people involved and you, you hear their stories and you see that they've, most of them, almost all of them have kind of had this life of service. Um, it's, it's humbling. It's encouraging. Uh, and as I said, you know, it's I, I do think things start at the top. Um, look, politics has always been divisive. It's not like before Trump, we were all singing kumbaya. Um, but <laughs> but you know, at least past presidents were able to even give some sort of a perfunctory um, narrative of us being in this together, where, where I think that's the opposite of what 
the guy in charge has done as of late. But 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 to your question, uh, I actually was really encouraged. And again, it was slow going at first, trying to create trust because we were asking uh, politicians to participate without fully knowing what we were asking of them. Um, but but over the course of a couple of years, I actually was really uh, inspired by by our experience there and the people we spoke with on both sides. This started because you sort of realized there was a lack of awareness about the specifics of so much of the alphabet soup of politics, DACA, NAFTA, et cetera, et cetera. How have you, like, what have you actually learned in the process? <laughs> uh, I learned that I don't know a lot. Uh, you know, and that's the problem. <laughs> it's easy to be an armchair politician. It's easy to sling facts you pick up uh, from a website as if you know the whole story. And, you know, there, there are so many ripple effects. You, you know, you, 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 you change one policy here and then 10 policies down the road, something else shifts. So you really have to have a grasp on how this entire mechanism works to assume a role in politics. And, um, you know, I think, like I said, a lot of people who choose to have really strong opinions on issues don't always have the whole story, myself included. That's part of the reasons I wanted to do this, because I saw that even I would go into discussions, you know, soaked in conjecture. And, and, and that, that's no way to actually move the ball down the field. That's just a way to try and feel like you're winning or, or feel like you're just shouting your point. You're not actually listening. Yeah. Soaked in conjecture is kind of like the, the I think all of us are, are pretty soaked in conjecture right now. Um, uh, Mark, can you I mean, was it hard to convince people to do this, given, you know, you guys are you guys are Hollywood guys. You you have come from a coast and there tends to be a healthy amount of skepticism um, about, you know, the bipartisanship or the neutrality of Hollywood, especially in this day and age. Was it was it easy to get Republicans on board to do this? What was the learning curve like? Not at first. I mean, you know, to Chris's point, you know, I mean, a people to be fair to anybody who participated in the site, when we asked people to do this, it didn't exist. So we had to write out mm -hmm. a sheet and say, here's what our intent is. And I think there's probably a longer list of people who have been fooled by people in Hollywood than people who haven't. So that was a fair, there was, you know, it's a fair pushback. Uh, you know, Joe, I went to Joe to help us out with this because Joe had been working on a bipartisan nature through things like the patient safety movement for years. So we basically drafted his credibility and he trusted us by getting us a couple of people to start with who were people who really believed in having a new way of, of or at least a way of more productive dissonance, productive dialogue. And then quite honestly, they came to us and once we started doing it and they said, you know, a lot of people like you come here and you tell us how to think and you guys asked. And so we just kind of followed that. And, uh, and through that quickly, we now have, you know, more, more people who want to do this and we have time to record, which is great. That's, that's a very good problem to have to both you and Joe. I, I guess I wonder you know, we are now in a zone where basic facts are up for debate and you guys are trying to present information to the public, but do it responsibly. You have fact checkers that you employ. Can you tell me a little bit about the tension between giving, giving people a platform to espouse their views, but not spreading misinformation, especially depending on what the topic is and who the speaker is? Yeah, I mean, sure. Starting points are more of our, you know, evergreen glossary. So those are fact checked by section and can go off and re reference to policy and to in reference backups based around starting points. Daily points and counterpoints are really held accountable by the fact that these are your elected officials. And so they have their own app in which they can upload things in daily points whenever they want. And counterpoints, we are scheduling more and more of our, our version of a debate. And, you know, we had a lot, we talked a lot, the three of us, about the best way and what was the most responsible way to, to do these mechanisms. But at the end of the day, these folks are elected to pass laws that will affect all of our lives. And so it's incumbent upon, you know, we, we also only give them about a minute or two. So there's only so much trouble they can get into, I think. Uh, <laughs> the minute's a long you know. time, Mark. <laughs> But, uh, but yeah, the first section is fact check. The second, the second and third sections are really, you know, a chance for them to convince their public of their ideals or of the people behind the policy. So, you know, hopefully if people have a difference of opinion about what they're saying. They'll choose to, to be moved to action. And through our site, there's two actions you can take. One, you can register to vote, of which 10,000 people have registered through our site so far. And you can contact that congressperson, uh, that government official, of which over 50,000 people have contacted their representatives through our site so far as well. Joe, how did these two guys rope you into this? And what is your <laughs> level of optimism? <laughs> what is I mean, I can assume I mean they're they're very charismatic. I'll give them that. But like what is what is what is your end goal here in all of this? How do you know that you've been successful? Well, 
First of all, uh, I think 2016 uh, was a wake-up call that we don't get enough young people voting, and uh, we needed to do more about that. And I, I went to Mark and say, Mark, I got 7,000 followers. Chris and you guys, you guys have millions of followers. Why don't you guys do more to try to get these people to get out and vote and get involved? So while I was looking for a mechanism, that's when Mark came to me and said, Chris has got really this cool idea of how we can do this in a way to get young people to feel like they can get engaged, they can learn, and they can get involved. Um, and, you know, to Chris's and Mark's uh, credit, they worked really hard at it. Uh, it wasn't just, you know, showing up uh, when, when it was time to get credits. It was doing all the work. Uh, I mean, Chris was in there not only interviewing people early morning till five, six, but then went up and met with the engineers who were developing it and would, you know, be involved in the layout of every little detail. So, uh, you know, it's it's really good to see somebody like these two, that especially Chris, that has everything going for him, caring about other people. You know, so many people are out there caring about their own tribe. Um, and it's really good to see someone like Chris care about all the tribes and want to make this thing work better for everybody. So I was in. And, well, and two things that went to Joe's credit. Joe, Joe um, would make us, anytime we would sort of think about what we were doing, what this is about, Joe would say, all right, what are our guiding principles? So when you say who's the most positive person in terms of what's possible, it's Joe. Joe actually is the uh, one that we think of in terms of what's the most positive way to move this forward. The other big thing that I can tell you that nobody else knows, here's breaking news about Chris Evans, uh, is that he's phenomenal at spreadsheets. So uh, uh, people would say what's the most surprising part of this. I thought you were going to say something be, else, but okay. No, I just think that's be great at actually going through the spreadsheets and being able to make sure that the questions were ordered properly. And like, you know, is this is really a grassroots fallback. movement. A fallback <laughs> yeah. career is what you're saying in case the whole movie thing doesn't actually, work out. It's good to know. <laughs> yeah, we, America yeah. was worried about what would happen to Chris Evans. Um, I know, he's going to be a master of group of He's good. <laughs> Chris, 58% uh, of the country voted in 2016. We are sitting on the precipice of, uh, you know, we always say it's the most consequential election of our lifetimes, but it really actually factually might be that. What is your level of optimism and where is your head at about as far as American uh, American political, the, well, as far as where the country is at politically, I should say? Yeah. Um, I, I think actually we even said earlier that I think everyone always feels like things are at their most bleak. You know, we, we always forget that things like this have happened before. So even though it's easy to be a little uh, cynical um, uh, when, when you kind of focus in on the political landscape, I, I'm trying to uh, not let that deter my efforts and focus on this website because I really feel like the goal here is to create participation and engagement uh, and, and hope that there is – more more good in the world than there is bad. Um, but but oddly enough, in the throes of this political website, I've never been less involved in what's actually happening in the political landscape because it almost is uh, a little depressing. It is a starting point, both metaphorically and quite literally. The site again is a starting point. Everyone should log on. It actually is a very it's a very important thing you guys are doing. It is it is not often that we talk about the the sort of the heart of these matters, and that's what you guys are trying to do. So thank you for your work. Thank you for your time, Chris Evans, Mark Casson, and Joe Kiani. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Alex. We Thanks appreciate so much. it. Thanks for having us. Okay. Bye. Thank you to all of our speakers and journalists for the conversations we heard tonight. And thank you for being here with us. If you like what you saw, please consider supporting our journalism by subscribing to The Atlantic. We really appreciate your support and your time with us tonight. We'll be back tomorrow with much more Hillary Rodham Clinton, Bill Gates, and many others. We'll see you then. Thank you and good night. The ambitious journalism you see here tonight and across print and online can't be made without your support. Please become a subscriber today. You'll get unlimited access to the incredible journalism of TheAtlantic.com, 10 issues a year of our unrivaled print magazine, and much, much more.